My name is Dave Nave. Russell A. Koff brought new insights into managing the interactions between the parts of a company rather than managing the behavior of each part individually. He called this approach systems thinking, and his insights are a tremendous contribution to business and society. On behalf of the Deming Cooperative, we are pleased to make these videos available to you for your continued learning. Or not, there's a book called The Thousand and Ten Solutions to the Nine Dot Problem. But they all involve taking an assumption that you make and violating it. For example, the assumption you must have your lines inside the square. I didn't say that, but people always assume that. The moment you go outside the square, you can find a solution. Or you cannot fold the paper. If you fold the paper, you can do it with one line. In fact, if you're a Japanese and no origami, you can do it with one dot. You can cover all nine dots by folding the paper. But my eight-year-old daughter got the best answer I've ever seen. She said, why don't you get a great big fat pen and just go blop? <laughs> See, there's nothing in the instructions that tells you the size of the pen to use. You have to find the constraining assumption, remove it, and explore the consequences. I remember a case of a bank, headquarters in New York, had 2,000 people employed there. And in the last six months, there were three major thefts, all of negotiable securities amounting to $14 million the bank had lost. They had caught two of the groups that had perpetrated the thefts got some of the money back. The third one got away clear, and they never did catch him. We're meeting in a boardroom with all the executives to consider how to increase the security of the bank so that no more thefts will occur. Uh, I had a graduate student with me. I frequently took a student with me because you never know when you might need an idea. <laughs> so he was sitting next to me quietly while we were putting television cameras in every nick, nook and cranny in the bank had a big control room where people sitting in front of uh, monitors could see every place in the bank. We put magnetic marking on every security, and we put magnetic detectors around the hallway so that every time you walk past one with a security, it sent off a signal. There were guards there who asked to see your author, whether you were authorized to do this. All this stuff. The student just sat there didn't say a word. Eventually, he leaned over and he talked to the CEO. He said, how do they get this stuff out of the bank? The CEO said, what do you mean, how do they get it out? It's just paper. Put it in your pocket, and you walk out. Or if you want to hide it, you put it in your shoe, or you put it in the lining of your briefcase, or the lining of your coat. The student said, well, why don't you do a paper check on everybody when they leave the bank? The CEO looked at him and said, are you crazy? Do you know how long it would take to do a check for paper on people leaving the bank? He said it'd take at least 10 minutes. Take 2,000 people at 10 minutes, and the people who work here one day are going to be here the next month checking out. You can't do it that way. Well, the student looked like he'd been sat on. He pulled his chair back from the table, and looked like he was sulking, and we went on back to the television cameras. Finally, he jumped. He said, I got it. I got it. Everybody in the bank worked in the nude. <laughs> Isn't that marvelous? See, it'd be hard as hell to get paper out if everybody left the bank in the nude. Now, what would normally happen? You pat the kid on the head and say, it's very cute. You know, it's infeasible. But that's not what happened. The vice president of operations said, hey, he's got an idea. He said, they don't have to be in the nude all day. They just have to be in the nude when they leave the bank. <laughs> Somebody else said, are you crazy? You can't have all the people that work in the bank in the nude as they walk out of the bank. And somebody else said, maybe you don't have to. And somebody else said, it doesn't make any difference how you do it. If you have one person inspecting another in the nude, it's not possible. So he said, well, then the problem is, how can we have them in the nude, find out where they're carrying paper without looking at them? And then they came out with a solution, which they installed. They went to Paris, and they got Dior, Saint Laurent, and Balmoran to design uniforms 
three uniforms for everybody in the bank, male and female, inside out, underwear, socks, clothing, beautiful uniforms of a quality much better than what the average worker would wear to work. They had a locker room when people came in where they would undress completely and put on the uniform. But between the place they undressed and put on the uniform, there was a shower room. And they had an option of taking a shower. All of this in privacy, none of this publicly. They didn't have to take a shower. But when they came out at night, they would have to undress and take off their uniforms, which would then be cleaned and laundered by the company, and then go through a shower room where high pressure water was coming at them in every direction and in which you could not get paper through. Then they would dress in the locker room and leave. And they eliminated the theft. All because somebody said, why don't they work in the new? You see, you would never come up with an idea like that if you start with the current system and say, how do I improve it to make theft less likely? By the way, this system has been used in other factories, in factories since, where there are small items that can easily be carried out that have high value. Okay? Finally, this process facilitates implementation because decisions are reached by consensus. Now, when you say this, the natural reaction is, my God, how do you ever reach a decision that everybody agrees to? The difficulty appears because people don't know what consensus is. They think it's something other than what it is, and they don't know what it is. Uh, a number of years ago, we were doing work at Clark Equipment Corporation. They had a new CEO, a genius by the name of Jim Reinhardt, who was hired from, he was the head of General Motors Canada. He was brought down, and the first thing he did is broke the top management of Clark into eight groups, took them away for a retreat uh, for a week at Notre Dame because Clark was located in Buchanan, Michigan, which is a suburb of South Bend, Indiana. He was on the board at Notre Dame, so he got their continuing education center, bought eight groups of managers, and had them each redesign the corporation. The last day, Friday, he brought them together into a plenary session, had each group present its design, and they used easel and pads, and they put the pads up on the room. It was a wide room, so there were eight designs across. They were none of them completely different from each other but no two completely the same. When they had all been presented, Jim got up and he said, uh, how many of you think the first design is the best one? And one eighth of the hands went up. Turned to the second group, said, how many of you think the second one's the best one? One eighth went up. Did this for three groups. And then he turned to me, I was sitting directly in front of him in the front aisle. He had one of these mobile microphones, you know, that you hold in your hand. And he threw it at me. He said, all right, you got me in this damn mess. Now you get me out of it. He said, you told me I can't even use a majority. How am I supposed to get consensus? I said, by asking the right question. He said, all right, wise guy, you ask the right question. So I, using his microphone, I said to the group, you have the following choice. You either pick one of these eight as the best and agree, or you let me pick one at random. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't give you the, the other alternative. The other alternative is to keep the current organization. You got a 100% vote that I pick one at random. Okay. Now once they saw that what they were agreeing on is any one of the eight was better than what they had, See, that was the consensus. And therefore, which one they picked was not the critical question. The critical question is that they pick one. At that point, they got back together again and picked one by slightly modifying it to have the properties of some of the others. And they reached complete agreement. Consensus is agreement in practice, not in principle. It's agreement that something is better than something else, not that something is the best possible. And these designs all operate by consensus, sensing agreement, but you have to be aware of what you are agreeing to. And then you get commitment. This design ought to carry it into a new era. But now 
in order to know what the design must do, you're going to have to know something about what moving into a new era involves. So right after a short break, we'll take up that question, OK? I'm sorry? OK. The uh, Industrial Revolution began in England about 1750 with the conversion of the textile industry through mechanization into modern factories, and that began urbanization as we know it today. The United States did not begin to industrialize in the sense in which the Industrial Revolution began in England until almost 100 years later. And the reason is clear when you look back. In 1750, when England was mechanizing, we were still a nation of villages. Do you know what the population of the United States was when the Declaration of Independence was written? It was two and a quarter million. The largest city was New York with a population of 32,000. Philadelphia was number two with 20,000. There were only 10 cities in the United States with a population of over 10,000. They were far apart. We had no communication system and no transportation system. We were not compact like Europe was, where they could create markets out of multiple establishments. We had to wait until the railroads were built, and that's between 1830 and 1850, and communication through Marconi's Telegraph was introduced. And then we began to industrialize. So about 1850, we entered the Industrial Revolution, and of course, in the next 50 years, we caught up with Europe. Although we weren't first, we did do one thing which we could either be cursed for or blessed for first. We created the first business school anywhere in the world, <laughs> the Wharton School. Joseph Wharton was a blacksmith who in 1881 endowed the University of Pennsylvania with money to establish a school to train young men on how to create and run a business. Now, shortly thereafter, Harvard and Stanford and Chicago followed suit, so there was a mad rush in the business schools in the last uh, 25 years of the 19th century. Uh, interestingly, when you start to teach something about business, you had to know what a business and enterprise was. So we had to have a concept. What is a business? Now, not surprisingly, the concept we had of a business reflected our concept of what we had of the world. At any period of time, we have what's called a worldview, a concept of what the nature of reality is. The worldview that dominated in the middle of the 19th century was the one formulated by Sir Isaac Newton. You see, Sir Isaac Newton said, the universe is a machine. Not like a machine, he said it is a machine, it's a mechanism. In fact, he went further, he said it's a hermetically sealed clock. We ultimately tell time by the movement of the planets. The clock is a mechanism that runs with a regularity dictated by its internal structure and the causal laws of nature. And it's hermetically sealed, which means there's no environment. It's self-contained, a closed system. That's the universe. So how did we look at a business in the end of the 19th century? It was a universe, a mechanism, and like the universe at large, it had a very interesting property, according to Newton. You see, there's a very important property of a system, which Newton realized, although there wasn't systems thinking in his day. Every system is defined by its function in a larger system of which it is a part. So if you want to say, what's an automobile? You have to describe its function, not its structure. It's a device for carrying people from one place to another of their choosing, under their control, and in privacy. So you describe its function. What's a computer? You don't say how it works. You say what it does, its function. Well, this was a problem for Newton, 
because he defined the universe as a system. Now, how can the universe, which contains everything, be a part of something larger? Now, that would have really stymied you and me, but it didn't Newton. He came out with an answer that permeated the Western world. He said, the universe is a mechanism created by God to do his work. See, he gave it a function. So what do we do with the enterprise? Exactly the same thing. The enterprise is a mechanism created by its God to do his work. But who was God? Hmm? The owner. Now, if you stop and reflect, the owner was all powerful. There were no laws, no unions, no regulations. He could hire who he wanted to, when he wanted to, pay him what he wanted to. He had complete control over the workforce. And so the workers were looked at as replaceable machine parts. We began then looking at an enterprise as a mechanism, and I'm going to show you the evolution from mechanism to an organism and then to a social system and what that all implies. So this is a Newtonian concept applied to enterprises. And this concept could prevail for some very important reasons. The owner was present and all powerful. There were no constraints on him at all. It was a plentiful supply of labor, most of it immigrants. They were very poorly educated. The average educational level of the American worker in 1850 was three years of education. Most of them were illiterate in English. But fortunately, the mechanization required very little skill. And so a highly skilled and educated workforce was not necessary. It was there and it was plentiful. But the most important condition was that there was no form of social security. You have to reflect on the implications of that. That meant if you didn't work, you had no income. And the only way you could survive is if you were a dependent of somebody who had income because society didn't take care of you. And therefore, under those conditions, people were willing to work under any conditions, and they did. And so the sweatshop and slave labor and the exploitation of women and children all followed because the workers had no alternative. Now, things began to change at the end of the century, beginning in 1900, because by 1900, or by the time of World War I, actually, the average educational level of the American worker had gone up to eight years from three. Uh, there was the beginnings of Social Security, and unionization had been introduced to protect the worker. More skill was required as the industrial production equipment got more complex and sophisticated. They began to pass laws which limited what managers could do to the workers, particularly with regard to their health and safety. But the most important thing that happened is frequently overlooked. Our economy grew so rapidly and was so healthy that if a corporation took all of its profit and reinvested it in growth, it still couldn't grow as fast as was possible. And so the fundamental problem that confronted American business about the time of World War I was this. Do we constrain growth by retaining ownership? Or do we share ownership in order to generate additional capital to unleash growth? In other words, do we go public or stay private? Now, as you know, all the major corporations went public. Ford was a private corporation. General Motors was a private corporation, even AT&T originally. They became public in order to generate the capital through equity financing. Now stop and think about what that did to the image of a corporation. God disappeared. Hmm? He was no longer president and all powerful. You have 250,000 shareholders out there that constitute collectively God. That's a very difficult abstract concept to deal with. So there were two problems. One is, how do you communicate with that God? And who does the communicating? Now, the young Peter Drucker, who was a journalist at the time, pointed out that the problem confronting American industry after World War I was exactly the problem that confronted the world 
2,000 years ago. God disappeared, or at least the Western world. What did we do? Well, we created an institution to make it possible for man to communicate with God, and we created a profession to administer that institution. It was the church and clergy. Well, Drucker said we created the institution called management, and the clergy called a manager, who was responsible for communication between the worker and God, the owners out there, the shareholders. How did the clergy and management know the will of God? Hmm? Same way, revelation. <laughs> How else? How are you gonna find out what 250,000 people want? So our concept of the corporation began to change. First of all, the company became a corporation when it went public. What's the origin of the word corporation? Corpus. Corpus is a body, it's a biological concept. And we noticed that the whole language of business and management converted about the time of World War I. So that the CEO of a corporation got to be called the what of the corporation? The head. You see, when it was a machine, you didn't talk about the head of a machine, but a minute it became a body, you talk about its head. And then we have a series of wonderful books that reveal the transformation. Stafford Beer wrote two of them. The first one was called The Brain of the Firm, Management. The second was called The Heart of the Enterprise, which had to do with the value system of the organism. He never wrote the third book in the trilogy, but I did, but I've never been able to get it published. It's called The Bowels of the Corporation. <laughs> but, the enterprise is an organism started about the time, the end of World War I, and now, unlike a mechanism, which has no purpose of its own, see, a mechanism is an instrument of a purposeful entity that's outside of it. So the universe, which has no purpose, was an instrument of God who had a purpose. The business had no purpose, but it served the purpose of the owner, which was to make a profit. Uh, in this country, Milton Friedman was the high priest of that point of view. He wrote the famous article in the New York Times, the only legitimate business of business is business, by which he said businesses exist only for one reason, to provide a return to the owner. That's a mechanistic concept of the corporation. What happened to profit when we began to think of a corporation as an organism? Well, again, you gotta go to that wise man, Peter Drucker, to find out. He wrote this beautiful statement, that profit is to a corporation what oxygen is to a person. Necessary for its existence, but not the reason for it. Profit, he said, is a means, not an end. Now, one of the best insights into that conversion was actually uh, done by an American humorist at the turn of the century, Ambrose Bierce, who isn't very well known anymore, unfortunately. But he wrote a marvelous book called The Devil's Dictionary, in which he tells you what words really mean, not what they're supposed to mean. And he has a definition of money, which is marvelous. His money is the only resource which has absolutely no value until you get rid of it. It's a means, not an end. What's the principal objective of any organism? Survival. And in order to survive, you must grow. Why? What's the opposite of growth? Contraction. What's the limit of contraction? Death. Therefore, survival and growth became the preoccupation of corporations in the post-World War I period. As I said, the CEO became the head of the firm, and health and safety of the parts became the preoccupation of both government and the unions. That concept of a corporation still prevails. It's the one of the age we're coming out of. We still treat corporations as organisms with the management as the high priests who communicate with the shareholders sometimes. You look at the problem that Disney is having right now where the God and the clergy are having a dispute 
We're getting a new concept called the social system. Now, what does that mean? First, look at what happened. World War II, about 90% of the American workforce was drafted into the military. At a time when we needed more productivity out of industry than we ever had before, so we had to replace the workers. And who did we replace them with? Rosie the Riveter, Tilly the Toiler, older people and kids. World War II changed the workforce in a very fundamental way. And it was changed in the following way. It's the first time we had a workforce that was not primarily motivated economically. They weren't working primarily to make a living. Why not? Well, when we were inducted into World War II, and I was one of them, Four days after Pearl Harbor, I got my first letter I ever received from the President of the United States, <laughs> which began greetings. <laughs> <laughs> and a few days later, I was in the Army, paid the magnificent salary of $21 a month. Now, as a civilian, separately, you couldn't live on $21 a month at that time. You certainly couldn't support dependents, but you didn't have to because the government provided an allowance to every dependent of anybody drafted into the military. Uh, that meant that the women who went to work in the factories didn't have to work for economic reasons. They couldn't live luxuriously without working, but they could live. And therefore, their primary reasons for working had to do with loyalty, commitment. And you can see that, if you ever watch the films made, the motion pictures made between 42 and 46 in this country? They all had the same plot. It was a heroin gal with a welding machine, welding airplanes or tanks or something like this while her boyfriend was over killing the enemy. It was a complete uh, recognition of the conversion of the nature of the workforce as working to pursue its own objectives, which was peace and victory. Then immediately at the end of the war, we had this peculiar phenomenon called the Spock generation. What was the Spock generation? Who was Spock? He was a child psychologist, right? Actually a physician. And what did he say that rocked the Western world? He said, you have to raise children permissively. You have to diminish discipline. And so in, by 1960, we had the first generation become adults who didn't know what discipline was. And they said, if you think we're gonna let the boss throw us around, you're crazy. And they began to demand that recognition of their interests and purposes be taken into account. There were further increases in skills required but now the educational level after World War II went up to 12 years plus. We had a more educated workforce. Now here is something very, very critical. Uh, it was about in the middle 1970s, we were doing work for the government of Iran when the Shah was still in power. And we were doing a joint project with a major research institute in Iran called the Industrial Management Institute on redesigning the health system of Iran, which, by the way, is still the same health system that we had designed back in the 70s. Uh, I used to go over regularly to work with the group over there that was headed up by Jamshid Gargadashi, who is now my colleague. We brought him to the States after the revolution. And when I arrived on one of my visits, he met me at the airport and said the Shah wanted to see me. Well, that was a surprise. I didn't know the Shah even knew I existed. She said, how come? Well, it turned out that Jamshid was the principal scientific advisor to the Shah and his, the queen, the Shah Du. And a problem had arisen that he had discussed with them and suggested they talk to me because he thought I might be able to help with the problem. So the Shah said, the next time he comes, bring him in. So there I was, invited to the palace. I'd never been in a palace, so I welcomed the invitation. And the next day, Jamshid and I appeared at the front door of the palace and were shown into a lovely waiting room. And for a little while afterwards, a, a man in a very fancy uniform came in and told me he, with apology, 
The shore had been, Shaw had been called off in an emergency, and we could hear the helicopter leaving the grounds of the palace. But he said, don't worry, don't worry. He said, he's made arrangements for you to talk to the queen. And she's thoroughly familiar with the problem he wanted to discuss with you. Well, that turned out to be marvelous. We were just lucky. For one thing, she's a hell of a lot prettier than he was. <laughs> she was a graduate architect from the Sorbonne. She spoke English fluently. And her study was unbelievable. It was a museum of Louis XV furniture. Beautiful, large room. Great big fireplace going. We sat across from each other in front of the fireplace for two and a half hours and discussed the following problem. The Shah was the most powerful ruler on earth. Now that's not a, a, an exaggeration. He was the only head of state that did not report to a constitution. The Shah of Iran reported directly to God. He was above the law. And therefore, if he made a decision you didn't like, the only appeal you had was prayer. That wasn't very effective. So nobody had the power he had. He could walk down the street and say, kill her. Boom, and that was done. No questions. But the question he had for us was, why can't I get any of my programs implemented the way I want them to be? Here is the most powerful ruler on earth that can't get his programs implemented. Now, fortunately, we knew the answer to that question, which he didn't know. He had sent 42,000 Iranians to the United States and Europe for higher education on the condition that they return to Iran at the end of their education. And so he had been flooded with PhDs and master's degrees from American institutions. And who the hell wanted them in Iran? Nobody did. Ram wasn't developed to the point to absorb these people. But they're dangerous. Because if you leave them alone with idle time, they're going to come up with some kind of revolution. So he took care of this by hiring them. The government was the most highly educated government in the world. Every secretary in the cabinet was a PhD. And they didn't like his policies. Now there's a basic principle. No manager can implement a policy that his subordinates don't accept. They can always sabotage it. He can't keep tabs on them, and they're smarter than he is. So the basic principle that emerges is this. The more educated a workforce is, the less effective the exercise of authority over that workforce is as a way of getting them to do what you want them to do. The more you have to use influence or persuasion rather than authority. What we have is a workforce that's gone from three years of education to more than 12, some college. And we continue to manage them as though they didn't know what they're doing. Now, recent studies have shown two things. Over 90% of the people employed in the United States today can do their jobs better than their managers can. And therefore, a manager telling their subordinates how to do their jobs is nonsense, but they continue to do it because their egos are involved. Okay? Per Gillenhammer, who was the CEO of Volvo, initiated an incredible study about, oh, 15 years ago. He called in Berth Johnson, who was his director of human resources, and gave him the following problem to work on. What percentage of what our workforce knows that's relevant to their jobs do we allow them to use? Isn't that a wonderful question? What percentage of what our workforce knows that's relevant to their jobs do we allow them to use? It took two years to do that study, and Bert Johnson produced this paper, which led Per Gillenhammer to create the seven in Europe that became the source of the European Union. And in the opening address of that thing, he said, if we use any other human resource, any other resource as poorly as we use humans, we, we wouldn't exist. 23% of what people know that's relevant to their jobs, they're allowed to use. Three quarters of what we know, they know that's relevant, we don't allow them to use. Therefore, a fundamental change is needed in the concept of management from one of supervision, which assumes the ignorance of the people being led, to one of assuming they know more how to do what they're doing than you do. 
And that requires a fundamental transformation. The growth of the corporation made it so complex that we had a development of a whole new theory, the complexity theory. And the one thing about complexity is we don't have a way of handling it from a centralized control point. The Soviet Union is a marvelous example. The Soviet Union eventually crashed because nobody at the head of it could control that vastly complex system. So it began to decentralize, it became necessary. And then, perhaps most important, was what happened in the environment of enterprises. We had parts of a system organized internally to protest the way the system of which they were a part served their purposes. The first time in history this happened. The race movement. Martin Luther King led blacks who were a part of society, organized them to protest the way society was treating them. But women's liberation was exactly the same thing, just a different principle of organization. People organized by sex, organized and now to protest the way society was treating them. Okay? The generation gap was the same problem with people organized by age in the hippie movement, complaining about the way society in which their part was treating them. The third world problem, the uh, alienation from work, all these problems consisted of people within a system organizing to protest the way the system was treating them and demanding that the system of which they're a part treat them as having objectives of their own. You see, when there was a machine, there were replaceable machine parts. When it was an organism, <coughs> the parts didn't have purposes, they had functions, and so their health and safety was critical. But now, all of a sudden, we had to start to take into account their purposes. And that was only the beginning of the problem. Because watching this happen, groups outside the enterprise organized to protest the way the organization was affecting them. There are two major social movements that emerged. One, the eco ecology movement, where people like the Sierra Club organized to tell corporations, hey, it's our environment you're polluting, and began to bring pressure on conformity to regulations controlling the environment, and the consumer movement led by Nader. The products that you're producing affect us and you have to take our interests into account when you do it. You can't ignore our health and safety. So all of a sudden, after World War II, managers were confronted with purposes at three levels. Purposes of the parts of the business, the purposes of the business itself, and the purposes of external units that could bring pressure to bear on a corporation. This is what complexity is all about. It's a multiplicity of purposes with inconsistent purposes at each level and inconsistency between the levels. That's complex. How the hell do you manage in all that complexity? Now, we've begun to make the transformation. The answer to all those questions lie in reconceptualizing the enterprise as a social system. It's a system that has purposes of its own, and we're going to look at them in a minute. But so do its parts, and so does its environment. And as a result, we have chaos and complexity, two recent developments in science, chaos theory and complexity theory. When we looked at it as a machine, the enterprise was a clock. Then we looked at it as a corporation. It became an organism with apology. The Shaw had, been, Shaw had been called off in an emergency, and we could hear the helicopter leaving the grounds of the palace. But he said, don't worry, don't worry. He said, he's made arrangements for you to talk to the queen. And she's thoroughly familiar with the problem he wanted to discuss with you. Well, that turned out to be marvelous. We were just lucky. For one thing, she's a hell of a lot prettier than he was. <laughs> she was a graduate architect from the Sorbonne. She spoke English fluently, and her study was unbelievable. It was a museum of Louis XV furniture, beautiful large room, great big fireplace going. We sat across from each other in front of the fireplace for two and a half hours and discussed the following problem. The Shah was the most powerful ruler on earth. Now that's not a, a, an exaggeration. He was the only head of state 
that did not report to a constitution. The Shah of Iran reported directly to God. He was above the law. And therefore, if he made a decision you didn't like, the only appeal you had was prayer. That wasn't very effective. So nobody had the power he had. He could walk down the street and say, kill her. Boom, and that was done. No questions. But the question he had for us was, why can't I get any of my programs implemented the way I want them to be? Here is the most powerful ruler on earth that can't get his programs implemented. Now, fortunately, we knew the answer to that question, which he didn't know. He had sent 42,000 Iranians to the United States and Europe for higher education on the condition that they return to Iran at the end of their education. And so he had been flooded with PhDs and master's degrees from American institutions. And who the hell wanted them in Iran? Nobody did. Iran wasn't developed to the point to absorb these people. But they're dangerous. Because if you leave them alone with idle time, they're going to come up with some kind of revolution. So he took care of this by hiring them. The government was the most highly educated government in the world. Every secretary in the cabinet was a PhD. And they didn't like his policies. Now there's a basic principle. No manager can implement a policy that his subordinates don't accept. They can always sabotage it. He can't keep tabs on them, and they're smarter than he is. So the basic principle that emerges is this. The more educated a workforce is, the less effective the exercise of authority over that workforce is as a way of getting them to do what you want them to do. The more you have to use influence or persuasion rather than authority. What we have is a workforce that's gone from three years of education to more than 12, some college. We continue to manage them as though they didn't know what they're doing. Now, recent studies have shown two things. Over 90% of the people employed in the United States today can do their jobs better than their managers can. And therefore, a manager telling their subordinates how to do their jobs is nonsense, but they continue to do it because their egos are involved. Okay? Per Gillenhammer, who was the CEO of Volvo, initiated an incredible study about, oh, 15 years ago. He called in Berth Johnson, who was his director of human resources, and gave him the following problem to work on. What percentage of what our workforce knows that's relevant to their jobs do we allow them to use? Isn't that a wonderful question? What percentage of what our workforce knows that's relevant to their jobs do we allow them to use? Took two years to do that study, and Bert Johnson produced this paper, which led Per Gillenhammer to create the seven in Europe that became the source of the European Union. And in the opening address of that thing, he said, if we use any other human resource, any other resource, as poorly as we use humans, we, we wouldn't exist. 23% of what people know that's relevant to their jobs, they're allowed to use. Three quarters of what we know, they know that's relevant, we don't allow them to use. Therefore, a fundamental change is needed in the concept of management from one of supervision, which assumes the ignorance of the people being led, to one of assuming they know more how to do what they're doing than you do. And that requires a fundamental transformation. The growth of the corporation made it so complex that we had a development of a whole new theory, the complexity theory. And the one thing about complexity is we don't have a way of handling it from a centralized control point. The Soviet Union is a marvelous example. The Soviet Union eventually crashed because nobody at the head of it could control that vastly complex system. So it began to decentralize, it became necessary. And then, perhaps most important, was what happened in the environment of enterprises. We had parts of a system organized internally to protest the way the system of which they were a part served their purposes. The first time in history this happened. The race movement 
Martin Luther King led blacks who were a part of society, organized them to protest the way society was treating them. But women's liberation was exactly the same thing, just a different principle of organization. People organized by sex organized and now to protest the way society was treating them. Okay? The generation gap was the same problem with people organized by age in the hippie movement complaining about the way society in which their part was treating them. The third world problem, the uh, alienation from work, all these problems consisted of people within a system organizing to protest the way the system was treating them and demanding that the system of which they're a part treat them as having objectives of their own. You see, when there was a machine, there were replaceable machine parts. When it was an organism, <coughs> the parts didn't have purposes, they had functions, and so their health and safety was critical. But now, all of a sudden, we had to start to take into account their purposes. And that was only the beginning of the problem. Because watching this happen, groups outside the enterprise organized to protest the way the organization was affecting them. There are two major social movements that emerged. One, the eco ecology movement, where people like the Sierra Club organized to tell corporations, hey, it's our environment you're polluting, and began to bring pressure on conformity to regulations controlling the environment, and the consumer movement led by Nader. The products that you're producing affect us and you have to take our interests into account when you do it. You can't ignore our health and safety. So all of a sudden, after World War II, managers were confronted with purposes at three levels. Purposes of the parts of the business, the purposes of the business itself, and the purposes of external units that could bring pressure to bear on a corporation. This is what complexity is all about. It's a multiplicity of purposes with inconsistent purposes at each level and inconsistency between the levels. That's complex. How the hell do you manage in all that complexity? Now, we've begun to make the transformation. The answer to all those questions lie in reconceptualizing the enterprise as a social system. It's a system that has purposes of its own, and we're going to look at them in a minute. But so do its parts, and so does its environment. And as a result, we have chaos and complexity, two recent developments in science, chaos theory and complexity theory. When we looked at it as a machine, the enterprise was a clock. Then we looked at it as a corporation, it became an organism. We look at it as a social system, it becomes a community. The first one to recognize this transformation was in the English Peter Drucker, Charles Handy. If you don't know his work, you ought to, because he's one of the most important thinkers about management and organization alive today. He did spend a year in this country at MIT, but he has a series of books which are absolutely central to understanding what's going on. The objective of the community is development, not growth. Now, that leads to a series of questions. Development and growth are different things, and we're going to see what the difference is in a moment. But the important thing about a community is it doesn't have any owners. Does it? Who owns Los Angeles? Has members, but doesn't have owners. The concept of ownership is unique to the previous concepts of the corporation. Even that radical journal called Business Week ran an issue in which the cover issue raised in that issue was who owns the business? And inside was a debate. <clears throat> On one side, they argued as follows. Ownership is a question of who has invested the most resources in the business. The shareholders are considered to be the owners because they've invested the money. But the argument went on, money is not the most important resource we have. It's renewable. If you lose the money, you can gain it again. But there's another resource that's much more important than money, 
What is it? It's non-renewable. Time. Time is the most important resource we have. It's finite and not renewable. Who invests the most time in the corporation? Turns out the employees do. And so the argument in Business Week is there's a position you can take that corporations are really owned by their employees. The shareholders are investors who deserve a return on their investment, but not control. They are not God or a surrogate for God. In a community, it's the members who rule. But they rule from the bottom up. You see, in a corporation conceived of as an organism, who picks the subordinates of a manager? The manager does, right? Each manager picks the people who report directly to him. But that's not what happens in a community. What happens in a community? It's the subordinates who pick their boss through elections. And so a community is a lower archy. And that became particularly conspicuous. I happened to be in Europe when Nixon resigned. And the Europeans were absolutely amazed. They thought this was the most important demonstration of what democracy was about that they had ever seen. That we put the president out of office from below, not from above, because there's nobody above him. And that's a lowerarchy. So we're beginning to look at enterprises as lowerarchies instead of hierarchies, as communities rather than as organisms. And this has a number of implications, including this one about development. Development is the increase in the desire and ability to satisfy your needs and your legitimate desires. Development is an increase in competence. Your ability to get what you want and to help others get what they want as long as what they want is legitimate. And by legitimate, you mean anything they want that doesn't reduce somebody else's ability to get what they want. Development and growth are not the same thing. A cemetery grows, it doesn't develop. A trash heap grows, it doesn't develop. Einstein continued to develop long after he stopped growing. Growth and development are not the same thing. Development is an increase in competence, and that's a matter of learning. Growth is a matter of earning. The criteria for development and growth are entirely different. The criterion for growth that we developed in the Western world is standard of living. Hmm? What's the criterion for development? If you answer that question, you're going to understand a lot of what you're doing and don't know why. The standard for development is quality of life. The reason that quality became such a central issue in the 1980s, Demi, Duran, Crosby, and the others, is that's the period in which we began to look at corporations as communities, recognizing that development is their central objective. And the measure of development is the quality of life the organization provides to its stakeholders, not necessarily the standard of living. Now, it's certainly, well, look at it this way. You have two people with equal resources. The one that can do the most with those resources is the most developed. But it is also clear that two people of equal competence, but one with more resources than the other, can do more to develop quality of life. So it doesn't say the quality of life is independent of resources, but it says it's resources help, but they're not essential. What's the strongest model in the Western world of a completely developed man? There's an interesting question for you. You're going to be amazed at the answer. Who is the paradigm you were raised with as the ultimate development of man, Robinson Crusoe. Hmm? Isn't that a wonderful story? Why? Here is a man with absolutely nothing but his own intelligence, his competence, and look what he did to his quality of life until that guy Friday came along and complicated his existence. <laughs> but there is the symbol 
of, uh, what are they called? The Swiss Family Robinson, the other one, creating this wonderful life of a very high quality just with competence. Whereas people who are very, very wealthy usually manage to destroy their quality of life and live a miserable life. So that I was just reading the other day about Hutton, who married seven times and was unhappy with each one of them, you know, had a miserable life. There's no assurance that more resources will bring a higher quality of life. Okay. So, development is an increase in competence. It's more a matter of learning than of earning. And therefore, management must become educators. In 1996, a study was done that showed that the total budget of all the universities and colleges in the United States put together was $67 billion. Okay. The same people who did that survey took all the money spent by corporations on higher education that's done internally, sessions like this, it's done inside the corporation, $83 billion. Corporations are a larger educational institution than colleges and universities. Unfortunately, they're no better because they use the same misconception about education as colleges and universities do. But they're more flexible, so the opportunities for change are greater. So irreverent courses and discussions like this one are very difficult to have in a university because you threaten the survival of faculty who are invested in the past, whereas here, you're talking to people who will have to survive against increasing competition that's making the conversion. And if you don't make it, you're not going to be there. We just think of what's happened in the last month. AT&T, the largest corporation in the world, is being bid for. And they're going to win. It's going to go out of existence. That's a transformation that's occurring. And if you don't transform, you're subject to acquisition or death. Quality of life becomes a critical question. Now, the function of a corporation looked at as a social system, what's its role? You want to define the corporation, you have to define it by its role in the society of which it's a part. And that is to produce and distribute wealth. A fascinating thing is that productive employment is the only way known to man of simultaneously producing and distributing wealth. Every other way of distributing wealth consumes it. But productive employment produces the wealth that is then subject to consumption. And therefore, we have a very interesting consequence. Downsizing is immoral. Now, you can imagine what happens when I tell a group of executives, particularly if they're from Scott Paper or Sunbeam, that downsizing is immoral. It's, what's his name? Chainsaw so-and-so. I forget his name all the time. It's worse than immoral. It's ineffective. Studies have been done, reported in the Wall Street Journal, that 80% of the corporations that downsize have increasing costs within two years. Now, anybody that reflects on it knows why it's ineffective, but why it's immoral is another issue. It's ineffective because corporations, when they want to downsize, will normally offer the golden handshake or the golden parachute, right? Who takes it? The most competent people. Why? Because they're the ones that are most sure that they can get another job. The least competent people are the most reluctant to take it because they're unsure about what their future will be. And so you find yourselves without the competence you require to conduct business. You've got to get it, so they go out and hire it from consultants at twice the cost. And so costs tend to go up instead of down, but employment goes down. Now, the terrible thing about downsizing is I've never seen a case where it's necessary. Now, what the hell does that mean? Well, let me give you a couple of cases. I'm going to take Clark Equipment first. When Jim Reinhardt was brought from General Motors Canada to run Clark Equipment, it was on the verge of bankruptcy. He immediately did a study to find out 
what was the problem. Well, he found excessive costs in a number of places, and one of the major ones was transportation. Now, Clark makes forklift trucks, excavators, backhoe loaders, heavy equipment that's distributed across the United States to distributors on very large bedded trucks. He had a transportation department with 150 trucks and 450 employees. He called them together one day and he said, gentlemen, I can't afford you anymore. I'm going to have to disband internal transportation. Why? He said, if I go to commercial carriers, I can reduce our transportation costs by $20 million a year. I can't afford you. We're on the verge of bankruptcy. He said, but unfortunately, I just can't let you all go. It's going to cost me money. He said, I have certain contractual obligations to every person we let go. And he went to the board and he wrote the number. This is what it costs to let an employee go. Now he said, if I take 450 of you times that, he then put down the number. And it was in the millions. He said, that's a big number. He said, you know, it's almost enough to buy the transportation department of this company, but not quite. He said, I went to the banks in South Bend, Indiana, and asked them, how much would they lend me if I put up this amount of cash to buy the transportation department of Clark? And they offered me this amount. He wrote the number down. If I add these two together, he said, that's enough to buy the department. He said, gentlemen, here's the choice you've got. You can buy the transportation department lock, stock, and barrel, and I will give you a two-year contract to do all the transportation work of this corporation, providing you give me the same price for moving goods that commercial carriers give me. They took it. Today, it's the largest trucking company in the North Midwest. Nobody lost their jobs, all because the CEO cared. He took seriously his obligation to maintain employment. It's a social obligation. Didn't have to do it inside the company. That doesn't make any difference to society. It's employment that makes a difference to society. General Electric. General Electric was the second largest producer of welding equipment in the United States, second only to Lincoln Electric. But General Electric only had about 8 or 9% of the market. Lincoln Electric has almost a monopoly on welding equipment for lots of reasons. GE did a study in which they tried to develop a strategy to increase their share of the market, and they decided they'd have to get the cost of equipment so far below Lincoln's that people that are loyal to Lincoln would buy the GE stuff just because they couldn't afford not to. The price was so different. And the way to do that was to build an automated factory that would eliminate labor. So they built a completely automated factory in York, Pennsylvania. They brought out the equipment, significantly lower cost than Lincoln Electric, and it made absolutely no difference. Their sales and their share of market did not change. At this point, they came to Wharton, and they said, can you help us? Should we stay in the welding equipment business? We did the study and said, no, get out. Nobody's going to attack Lincoln. We know why they've got such a loyal following. Get out of the business. He said, yeah, we've got this brand new plant that's completely automated with the latest computerized equipment. What do we do with it? So the plant was offered for sale at a price significantly below its value. I mean a real bargain. But there was a condition. You could only get it at that price if you kept the workforce. Within two months, they had a buyer. The buyer was tickled pink. They got a brand new factory, completely automated with a workforce and knew how to run it. A small workforce, but they knew how to run that place. They got the plant for practically nothing. And General Electric made money out of the deal. How? They didn't make money on the plant. Where'd they make the money? transfer the benefits. They didn't have to pay any of the contractual benefits. The new employer assumed all those obligations. Yeah. At one point, Toyota and the recession in Japan calculated they had 25,000 extra employees. If an Amer a typical American corporation would have fired 25,000 people, which is essentially what 
Eastman Kodak has done. But they didn't. They took those people off their jobs and said, you are now consultants to the manager to whom you used to report. And your task is now to increase the efficiency of the department of which you were a member. And they kept a record of what happened over the next year. For every dollar they spent in salary, they got a $3 improvement in performance. See, the, the moral is there's no one thing but a manager who recognizes that the business is a community and has an obligation to society of which it's a part to maintain productive employment can always find a way to do it if they take this as an obligation of management. And when you begin to look at a corporation as a social system, that conversion and point of view is necessary. Mm -hmm. So, what does a movement into the new era entail for an enterprise? First, the adoption of systems thinking to which I've alluded but not discussed in any detail here. Democratization in order to exploit the knowledge and competence of the workforce. We have to convert to an internal market economy. If you stop and reflect, you remember Perestroika and Glasnost, the Soviet Union? Corporations have that problem today. Perestroika was what? The fact the Soviet Union couldn't survive as a hierarchical autocracy. It had to democratize in order to use the knowledge that was available within the country. Glasnost was that a centrally controlled economy and a complex system could not be efficient. The internal market economy is capable of operating closer to rationality than any centrally controlled complex system. So we now have questions raised about what does an internal market economy look like in a corporation? We're gonna come back to that point. The average length of time in an American corporation between reorganizations is four years. Studies have shown it takes two years to absorb the last reorganization and two years to get ready for the next one and about 20% of the corporation's resources are consumed in continuous reorganizations. Is there any way to organize so you don't have to reorganize? And the CEO of Dow Corning figured out how to do it a number of years ago in what is called a multi-dimensional organization, and we'll take a look at that also. You also have to promote organizational learning. Not individual learning, but organizational learning. It's a difference. I uh, spent 42 years working continuously with Anheuser-Busch Corporation. And when the management, August Bush III, retired a while back, and most of the vice presidents did, half of the vice presidents were former students of mine, a whole new management came in. So I don't do very much work with them anymore. But every once in a while I get a communication from them. I got one a couple weeks ago said, we've just completed a study of the effectiveness of billboards as a means of advertising. Would you look at it and tell us what you think? So I read the report and I sent it back with a short note. I said, the study is very good. It reached exactly the same conclusions we got 25 years ago. I got an immediate phone call. What do you mean you got it 25 years ago? I said, we did, we did that study. He said, we didn't know about it. I said, of course you didn't. You were in diapers when that study was done. <laughs> But you see, there was no organizational memory and so no learning from it. You need an organizational memory to remember what's learned. Now I'm gonna talk about the difference between organizational learning and individual learning. It's absolutely essential that you create a learning support system within corporations if you wanna move into the new era. 